So hello everyone and welcome to 33 Founders. I am ecstatic that you're joining us today because we're here with Gabby Lewis and Craig Savitz, the minds behind the world's first cricket flour protein bar. So thanks so much for joining us, guys. Thanks for having us. All right, so EXO has been on the chew and people love the flavors. I was pretty shocked you got Mario Batali to smile about it. And it was served at the Clinton Global Initiative as the dessert. So I want to start out with a simple but obvious question. Why should I eat a protein bar that has cricket flour in it? Sure. So crickets are exceptionally nutritious. They're high in complete protein, which is the best quality protein with all the essential amino acids. They're also high in micronutrients like iron, calcium, B vitamins. Crickets, for example, have more iron than beef, more calcium than milk. So extremely good for your body. On a more global scale, they're also extremely sustainable to raise the protein source. So crickets, for example, will require 20 times fewer resources to use than cattle. So it's less feed, less water, less space, 80 times fewer methane emissions. So overall, it's a protein source that's extremely good for you and the world. All right, and can you guys tell us the flavors that you have? Yeah, so we have um, coconut, which is basically a chocolate. That was the original flavor. Peanut butter and jelly, blueberry vanilla, and apple cinnamon. Perfect. All right, and you were just telling us how in Uganda, I mean, this is something that's pretty normal. But so you bring it into an America, and people are a little bit hesitant. Um, I mean, things like this take a while to catch on sometimes. I mean, you have sushi, which took decades to be popular. So how are you accelerating this process with your educational efforts? Uh, you're right. Sushi took a long time to catch on. Um, and I think it was part of the reason that happened was it was really one of the first foreign cuisines to really be adopted almost now as an American staple. Um, and since then, there's been such a huge movement in the food world that now you see chefs as the biggest celebrity rock stars. Everybody watches a reality TV show about cooking. Um, people consider themselves foodies. They pride themselves on the weirdest, uh, grossest parts of the animal that they can find and cook and eat. And so the whole culture around food um, has shifted from being sort of something that's purely functional to like eat as quickly as you can to something to really be enjoyed um, and to even push boundaries and help solve some larger social problems. And so I think the people are primed to both eat things that might not have been considered staple um, foods in their diets and also go out of their way to eat something that does make them uncomfortable, but yet they know has some sort of greater good um, or, or still evaluated based on its, its nutritional profile, for example, and then crickets come out as an amazing food in and of itself. So I think that a lot of the work is sort of just um, cultural. There's so many trends going on you know, the, the new CrossFit and paleo trends, which are sort of uh, fitness philosophies and diet philosophies, all point towards insects as a great source of uh, nutrients. And even in the time we've been doing it over the past six months selling these bars, the acceleration of enthusiasm and adoption has just increased so much, I think purely because there, it, the idea is ricocheting around and you're seeing more and more influencers talk about it and people are just becoming... Um, more and more accepting of, of the concept. Yeah, and even though it took perhaps 100 years for, for lobster to move from prison food to the epitome of fine dining, and then 30 years from sushi to move from something niche that's only done in Hollywood in the California roll to something that you can find in the Charlotte airport, there are more recent foods that have made this transition from novelty to mainstream. So kombucha, Greek yogurt, Oregon meat. So there's this long list of foods that have made the exact same transition we're trying to bring about with insect protein that suggests it can be done and there is a path and the timeline is accelerating as we learn more about nutrition and get more interested in foods, like Greg said. Yeah, and I'm sure though that you will come across and you have the people who want to restrict their diets to pizza, tacos, <laughs> the standard American food. So when it comes to user acquisition, is it worth it to try to change them? or to just seek open-minded customers? Right now, we're definitely focusing on um, early adopters and, and people who are open-minded about the idea, who will, will sort of eat anything that they think is good for them, regardless of some irrational psychology they might have. Um, we're not really trying to convince 
the people, like you said, who like, like only want to eat their comfort food that they've grown up with for 30 years. Uh, but that's not to say that one day um, insect protein will get to a place where enough people are eating it as part of their normal diet that those sort of last holdouts are willing to try it. And then even they'll see that it actually is no different from the other foods that they've been eating. And I wouldn't even be surprised at that point if insect protein was being factored into the foods that right now they're like using as, as their, as their, you know, last resort. Yeah. And I think one lesson we can draw from the various case studies I mentioned previously, like sushi, kombucha, Greek yogurts, is that food, food trends inevitably trickle down from the influencers at the top. And so by targeting these early adopters in the fine dining world or CrossFit and paleo, there, there is a movement to trickle down into people that maybe perhaps wouldn't consider eating crickets if we went to them directly. But they see these people they admire and respect and who know about nutrition and food, and it's easier to convince them through those influencers. So how are you targeting these top-level influencers? We send a lot of cold emails. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you... Go ahead. Sorry. No, I was going to say, this movement has been happening in the fine dining world for a very long time. So Noma in Copenhagen, currently ranked the number one restaurant in the world, regularly features insects in its menu. Same with Clarity's in London, the Fat Duck also in England. Many of the world's finest restaurants have been doing this for a long time. And so it's already on the radars of these chefs. So when Mario Batali tried our bars, it was obviously not the first time he tasted insects. When we attracted Kyle Connaughton to develop our products, he came from the Fat Duck restaurant in England, and he cooked with crickets for many years. So it's much easier than some might expect to adopt this kind of talent to these influencers because they already know that the world is doing this. And they already recognize that it's no more weird than organ meats or sushi or any of these things that we have that we had a stigma against and now we've come to recognize as more normal. So you guys have stated that the moment you knew that EXO was going to be successful was actually in a CrossFit gym when somebody jumped up saying how much they liked it and it showed that your bars had social value. What does social value mean for food entrepreneurs? It's a good question. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think for us specifically, I don't know if I want to speak to food entrepreneurs more generally, but this is a product which is weird at first at first glance. And the first time you hear about cricket protein, your mind goes to, to developing countries, you eat insects, and you assume it's going to be unappetizing. The quickest way to get people past that bias is to have someone who they respect or admire tell them that it's not weird. Or try it and say to them, here, like, friend, try this. I just did it. It's awesome. It's good for you. It's good for the environment. And it's not actually that strange. And so at various events, we've had tremendous success with simple things like giving out a button which says, I just ate crickets or crickets are delicious. And our product in particular is one which lends itself perfectly to viral word of mouth marketing. Because whenever someone tries it and they learn this is a delicious product which is good for them and can potentially change the world if we get to enough scale, they want to tell everyone about it because it's, it's something new that they've never considered and they have this amazing light bulb moment that they want to share. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a literal social value. Was your question more about like sort of like greater good and change or was that what I you I was expected? referring to the literal social value of, hey, I just tried this and I want to share and it's because I saw something on a blog called Buzz Farmers where they said that they compared you guys to Tesla, and they said that Elon should start loading up Dragon cargo ships with EXO bars and put SpaceX astronauts on an EXO exclusive diet. So that's what really caught my eye, and I wanted Pretty to know cool. what does it take for you guys to eventually become the Tesla of the cricket flower industry? Um, I think Gabby mentioned it earlier. I think a lot of it comes down to scale, and and you know the there wasn't really a supply chain for human grade crickets before it, we started doing this about six months ago, and it, the the price of cricket powder is still fairly expensive. It's probably in line with like the most premium whey protein you can buy. And obviously, in theory, that should be a lot cheaper, right? Because the whole idea is that crickets use far fewer resources mm -hmm. to raise equivalent protein as cows or pigs or chickens do. So there's still a lot of, um, of upside to be seen when the scale gets to a place that those prices come down and sort of the operations can expand and we can really go through and figure out how to really optimize every step in the process. Um, and 
I think at that point, then you can start to maybe sort of go after a, a wider mass acceptance in the way that I think Tesla is trying to sort of take their electric car concept and just like appeal to the guy who like would have bought a Ford before, but now would buy Tesla. I think Tesla is still obviously like an incredibly high end brand, but I'm assuming that's sort of like their end goal is to sort yeah, of. Yeah, I think so. I think that's what they want to do eventually in the next couple of years with their new model. Right. Yeah. And so, I mean, you guys have tons of flavors, though. How do you come up with and test all of these? We have an incredible chef who <laughs> I mentioned earlier. We <laughs> was formerly the head chef at the former number one restaurant in the world. So he develops all of our recipes. And then it's a fairly informal process. We go to him with various nutritional parameters. The bars have to be within a certain caloric range and a minimum uh, amount of protein and uh, a maximum amount of sugar and so on. <laughs> He develops a range of recipes, we tell him what we like, we sample with some friends, we do some surveys, and then we kind of narrow that large list down, and he iterates on what we narrowed it down to, and it's, it's a process, and then we came up with two flavors early on, and we last week introduced two new flavors. And you actually discontinued, though, your uh, cashew ginger flavor. <laughs> tell us about that. Yeah. We, um, so we have another flavor, cashew ginger, which... Um, we had some production issues with that. The cashew butter doesn't kind of bind as well as almond butter, for example. And so we had the lowest yield on the production line. It was also our most polarizing flavor. Some people try it and they don't like ginger. And then they make the leap to saying they don't like cricket bars, which is not a leap we ever want anyone to make. It's important to us that the first time someone tries a cricket bar, they think it's delicious. And... If they don't like ginger and they happen to have a cashew ginger bar, that's not going to happen. So we discontinued it for the time being for that. But we, we didn't replace its flavor number, so maybe one day we'll bring it back <laughs> by popular demand. So right now I know you guys are focused on online sales and getting the product out there. And one of the ways you've been doing that is through the demos that, Gabby, you just touched on with the pin saying, I just had crickets and they're great. What is your best strategy for a food entrepreneur to do a great demo that will acquire customers? I mean, I think the demo really comes down to who's doing the demoing. So we make sure we have extremely knowledgeable and enthusiastic people doing the demos if it's not us. So we, we do it all internally. Um, I haven't had much experience with outsourced demoing, so it could be great. But right now we're doing it internally and doing a huge amount of training with everyone who we bring in to do it and making sure they understand every aspect of our business, not just the product in terms of the company history and the ultimate goals and I think it's always great for someone to come up in, in a store and try the product, but then learn more about the bigger picture vision of the company and interact with the founders and not just be told, there's a protein bar that has like 10 grams of protein and this amount of sugar, because that, that's not interesting for people. Yeah, I mean, we really try and do most demos ourselves, or at least have one of us there with somebody else, just because um, I think now it was somebody told us a quote the other day that now's the time to do things that just can't scale. And that's the kind of thing where obviously as we get bigger, Gabby and myself aren't going to be able to like go to every demo that's happening. But right now we can and we can touch basically every store that we're in. And so there's no reason why we shouldn't be doing that. I mean, it's, it's, it's great for us. The customers really appreciate it. So, Yeah, and that's a broader philosophy that permeates um, a lot of our business decisions. So we send customers personal emails and occasional phone calls, and we gather feedback that way, which when we do it, customers are so surprised to get an email or a phone call from a company founder, hmm. and they're so grateful, and they send such amazing letters of support in return, but that's something that obviously we can't do forever, but right now it has tremendous value, and it increases their ability to market our product by word of mouth, because they want to tell this great story. Absolutely. Yeah. So now you guys just graduated from the Excel Foods uh, Accelerator, and we actually just talked to Jordan and Lauren on the show the other week. So we've heard everything from their point of view. Now let's go to your point of view. Um, well, what are some of the main learnings that you've taken away from the program? Um, I mean, we were an interesting case because when we started the program, we didn't. We, we literally um, made our product for the first time. Um, or no, we actually hadn't. When we started the program, we didn't have like our final bars yet. We had samples in mm. temporary packaging. Um, we actually only made the full product for the first time a month or two into the program. So I think 
it was a learning experience for everyone because they had designed it really to be um, for to sell it. Packaged. What? They designed it for already packaged, right? Well, already packaged and already established companies. I think their sweet spot was sort of taking a, a, a local brand and sort of accelerating that to a more uh, national or, or larger scale platform. Um, and so one of the things, I mean, we, we still got tremendous benefit from that, obviously, because it allowed us to put in place best practices that a larger company would sort of come to learn eventually right from the beginning. Uh, and that was really useful because we were able to sort of th talk and think about the company as if it were farther along than it, than it was. And that, I'm sure, spurred, you know, it's like fake it till you make it. So that was really useful. Um, they also have extensive experience in the legal world and, and sort of business consulting. So it was really useful for us. Obviously, we just graduated from school to have that expertise. And they definitely got us more buttoned up, I think, than Gabby and myself would have been on our own. Um, I, don't know what yeah, I mean, we viewed it primarily as a platform for establishing phenomenal relationships in the food world. And this is really a relationship business. And we've met so many incredible investors and fellow entrepreneurs and distributors and brokers and retailers who otherwise it would have taken us perhaps three years to meet through a huge amount of forced networking. We met them in five months through Excel Foods. Um, and so that's just accelerated every aspect of our business tremendously. So you talked about just a few months ago, you guys not a few months ago, but when you first started Excel Foods, you guys didn't even have the product completely finished and packaged and everything. And I know that's because this wasn't the intended journey. Both of you guys had plans for after you graduated school. But having gone out on a limb and done this and been so successful so far, what's been the best part? The best part for me is doing something that intersects all of my interests and passions. So... My plan wasn't to start a cricket bar company after graduating college. My plan was actually to work at a hedge fund for a couple of years and then ideally start my own company at some undefined time in the future when I felt it was right. And I think a lot of young people have a similar plan. They work in finance or law or consulting for a few years, even though they know they want to be entrepreneurs, but they tell themselves they'll learn amazing skills the first few years and then we'll start a company when the time is right. But I found something which intersected my interests in fitness, sustainability, food, nutrition, environment, all of these things in one product, which happened to be a cricket bar, which sounded ridiculous to my parents and everyone at the time, but it was true. And so now, in the best part, as cheesy as it sounds, is literally waking up and spending my working hours focused on something that I really do care about, which is rare. <laughs> Yeah, definitely rare. I, I mean, for me, I think um, the best part is sort of feeling like I uh, created something out of nothing and, and, and own it completely with Gabby. There's no one telling us what to do. There's nothing I ever do that I do. Um, and I don't think that's true really of any other job. And I also think that it's pretty rare to feel like there's no downside to what we're trying to do every day. We wake up essentially trying to further the mission of getting people to eat insects. And there's literally only positives that can come from e each new person that is comfortable eating insects is entirely making the world that, that tiny bit better. Um, and that's, and that's a cool thing to, to really know and feel. That's great. And one of your biggest accomplishments so far was securing over a million dollars in funding, which is great. So congratulations on that. And Gabby, you've mentioned that getting Tim Ferriss to work with you guys was a long journey. And I, I know you went through a lot to even get your first call with him. Can you run us through that? Sure. So there, I mean, there are a variety of influencers who um, have influence within different spheres that it so intersects, whether it's entrepreneurship or fine dining or food or environments. Tim Ferriss was fairly unique in that his writing and his books and his audience, they kind of intersect all of those, all of those spheres. And so for, for a while, he was number one on our list of potential investors or advisors or influencers to get involved in some capacity. And eventually, through Excel Foods actually, through Jeffrey Zerowski, 
who runs the Coleco restaurants, or Tom Coleco, the craft restaurants rather, we were introduced to Tim and had an initial phone call which lasted quite a long time and he grilled us on every aspect of our business but he loved the product and I guess we passed his grilling and he's now an investor and an advisor of the company. What are you Will learning? he be uh, coming out with the four-hour cricket soon? Yeah. Well, in the four-hour chef, actually, he has a recipe for cricket protein bars, totally unrelated. Oh, wow. That's wow. so cool. Yeah. What are you guys learning working alongside him? We're learning a lot about PR. That's like one. He, he's extremely talented at finding angles for stories and how to craft pitches and all that kind of stuff. So he's teaching us a lot there. He also has a tremendous wealth of knowledge around nutrition, which is a world where there are so few agreed upon truths. I mean, every, every nutritionist disagrees on whether fat is good or saturated fat is good or bad, and whether paleo makes sense and so on, but he, he knows more than, than most. And so he's been teaching us a lot about that, and we're fine-tuning our recipes to reflect some of his thoughts there. Yeah, he's also just seen so many companies go from nothing to something hugely successful. So it's just, he's useful to have around, again, sort of for that best practice idea of sort of pointing out pain, pots, pain points that he's seen other companies go through before we might even know to look out for them. So that's been useful too. What's been one of yours? A pain point? Yeah. Running out of inventory has been a huge pain point for us. It's a good and one. He, and Tim, I, like he, you know, he had a supplement business before. Actually, he wrote any of his books anyway. So he actually also has dealt with trying to navigate a physical product too. And so, I mean, we we keep running out of product. Essentially, we we were limited partly by cash before now, and that's really why we wanted to raise some money to put back into inventory so that we could stockpile a little bit so that we weren't sort of constantly on the edge of of running out, but the demand is just continued to be bigger even than we predict. So, which is an awesome problem to have. Yeah. And still, it's still a problem. I definitely agree there, and I can completely envision you guys on thirty under thirty in the coming years. But for the next twelve months, what do you want to happen for you to feel entirely successful? Sell a lot of protein bars. <laughs> Sorry, that's our one. That's mission. the plan. That's the only plan. So, I mean, the larger vision is obviously. A a lot more than just selling protein bars, but right now, we think the first important stepping stone to introduce the insect protein more broadly is by selling a ton of these bars. And so our focus for the next six, 12 months is exclusively on these bars. And after that, we'll expand the product line and release a lot more flavors and so on. Great, thank you guys so much for joining Great. us today. Thank you.